Okay, so I will talk, uh, as I said, I will talk about space technology and about uh, climate change. And uh, for me, thank you very much that you are coming, that you take this afternoon to discuss a little bit about that. The thing is, of course, we have challenges in the world. And you know all of these challenges, and each and every one has his specific priority list. So I have here a list of challenges from climate change to migration, mobility, communication, energy, shortage of resources, demographic de development, conflicts, catastrophes, health. I did not put the elections in Ireland, on that list. <laughs> uh, but anyhow, um, curiosity. I put curiosity also on that list. Uh, I hope you can see it also from there, otherwise I will move away. Uh, curiosity for me is the strongest driver of humankind and we should never forget about that. Uh, it's clear these are really global challenges, but curiosity is what drives us uh, finally. And space is really <laughs> having contributions to all of these different challenges. But um, there must be something how to tackle the challenges. And I will explain in a minute what I believe what is very important. First of all, ESA, the European Space Agency, is uh, not uh, part of the European Union. We are an intergovernmental organization created in 1975 by a convention which is still valid. And our narrative today is that we are working in four areas. Science and exploration, that means we are looking to the near field, meaning lowest orbit, moon and Mars, but also deep into the universe to stars and galaxies. We are doing applications, Earth observation, navigation, telecommunication. We are doing enabling and support. Enabling and support means also technology development, but also launchers. Okay. So, and then you see here a new pillar, which is safety and security. I will not go into detail of all these programs because we are talking today about climate change. For me, it's important to have a destination of what you are doing. Goals is one thing, but first to have a destination. And for us, the destination are three different types. The society at large, competition as such, and the environment. The environment explaining the environment of the surface of the Earth, climate change, but also the environment around the Earth. So these are the main destinations of ESA where we are very active. Space 19 Plus, just to give you a feeling, um, is something, uh, as I said, we are not part of the European Union, but uh, we are an intergovernmental organization. Ireland is a member state, and every three years the ministers of the different member states are meeting, and the director general has to put proposals on the table, what he would like to do, and then the member states decide where they give their money for. So we are starting from scratch always, and if the proposals are bad, then we get nothing. We were very lucky last time, it was in November last year, we got 14.5 billion euros for the next three years. And here you see the distribution according to the pillars I explained before. So science and exploration, applications and enabling support, all three, something like 30%, plus the safety and security pillar. Now, Ireland also contributes to it, and here you see it as a comparison, the distribution of Ireland. And I tell you, this is very special because it's more or less the same as we have for the overall ESA. This is not normal, but I would watch what is normal. The average is, of course, the picture before, but many member states have their specific points only and say we are going only in this field or only in that field. And I think it's a very, very clear strategic decision of Ireland to go in the same fields as ESA is working, and this is um, a very nice thing. Now, just to mention also, 70% of our money comes from our member states, 23% we are also getting money from the EU for Galileo, the navigation system, and Copernicus, the Earth observation system, and Umetat and others. When we are talking about challenges, people sometimes make a step too fast and say, okay, we observe it, we observe uh, catastrophes, we observe climate change, we are observing this and this and this. And I believe one has to go a step back and first of all understand how to identify global challenges. It's not trivial at all. You have first of all you have to discover something like climate change. It's not a given that you understand it. If you look outside and you see there is some weather, but weather is not climate. Climate is something bigger. So therefore, if you look to the US, they had a very cold winter, they would say, where the hell is climate warming? It does not exist. Uh, and we had here, here a lot of uh, storms. Is that climate, a change of climate? So therefore, you first have to discover an effect. Then you can monitor it. 
you are identifying special parameters, metrics, with which you can explain the challenge. The next point is also important, to raise awareness. If the scientists stop with just monitoring, giving data, numbers, uh, thousands of numbers, nobody will understand. So the next very important step is to raise awareness. And then the final point is, of course, mitigation. And it starts again from scratch, again and again and again. So this one, I will show you now. I will show you this one, I will show you this one, I will show you this one, and I will also show you this one, and what space can contribute to the different areas. Let's go first to the discovery. Discovery of climate change was not done on Earth. Nobody found climate change on Earth. It was found on our neighbor planet, Venus. There was a mission to Venus, and they observed Venus. And Venus has a greenhouse effect, which is by far stronger than the one we have on Earth. So therefore, the discovery was done on Venus. And then some people said, okay, maybe we have exactly the same issue on Earth. So this was a discovery part. It is so important because it's so difficult. Therefore, I'm always saying this first thing, the discovery of an effect, this is at least as important as the whole rest. So, okay, they found it, and then we looked into it. And we are looking into it with different satellites, from different point of views, in different fields of frequencies, in different areas. So uh, we can really observe the Earth, we can uh, measure the melting of glaciers, we can measure the, the sea level, we can measure uh, uh, also the temperature as such. Very many parameters which can be measured uh, through um, space activities. And that means more than 50% of the so-called essential climate variables can be measured only from space. Um, and there are interesting things, for instance, how to measure sea level rise. You go there at the shore and, and measure it, it's of course it's not possible. So therefore, you need some uh, specific methods, and the method we, I'm talking about is now uh, to measure that from space. And there we can see, for instance, temperature distribution around the world. It's not important to see it just at the location, but around the world we can measure it. Here the sea temperature is uh, shown around the world. We can show also the algal, algae uh, development, because of course this has some relation with the temperature. Again, we can do it from space. We can uh, look also to the air pollution, NOx, the concentration in Europe, so you are in a good situation over there, it seems to be. Um, but uh, so we can, we can measure that from space and by that also give them some first information. We can measure wind speed now. It's not trivial at all to measure wind speed. It took us uh, something like 16 years to develop a satellite which could measure really wind speed. So it's flying in, uh, around the Earth and having a laser on board, an uh, ultraviolet laser, and uh, by measuring the reflection of the ultraviolet ultra uh, laser on, on simple particles in the air, uh, dust particles, etc., it's measuring the velocity. Like you know, if a car goes by, this effect, the so-called Doppler effect, this is measured from this uh, satellite, uh, and we get the whole profile of uh, wind velocities, uh, which is uh, a very important thing. Of course, we can also look from space into a situation of a hurricane, for instance. In this case, it was in 2017. But there, we don't measure the speed at the different location. In this case, it was just the temperature. Um, and therefore, to bring these two sets of data together, then you really have big data. Big data, for many people, is just a lot of data. This is wrong. Big data means you bring together several information from several sources, and suddenly you have better information. For instance, if I know your name, if I know the number of your credit card, if I know what type of credit card it, and I have the security number on the far side, I have your money. So it's only four, four information I need, and this is big data. So therefore, big data means also to bring together temperature and velocity and some other information. So this is uh, what it's all about, to understand climate change. We can also see what is the 
the origin of changing our climate. There's a lot of things. The pollution I mentioned already, but another thing is, of, of course, deforestation. You see here the rainforest in Paraguay in 1985. It is in so-called false colors, meaning healthy forest is shown in red. Now, if you look to this picture, and you're here in the first row, you can see that here is a small road. I will now move to the next picture. It will be the same picture, but only a couple of years later, and you can just orient yourself that this road is still there. I can put my finger over there so that we don't forget it. So you see, it's still the same road, only some years later. And there, this picture, I think, is also for raising awareness much more impressive than just to see one tree falling down. That's a nice picture, but what does it mean? Here you see really what is happening with our, what we are doing, what we are doing with our world. So we are really cutting um, the lung of our earth. We can also see by using big data again, we can understand what the sea level rise is. If you have just one satellite, and these are many satellites, for instance, one satellite would, would capture a period of, let's say, uh, five years or so, you would not see really a tendency of sea level rise. But using the data from many, many satellites from 1994 to today, you really suddenly, you, you see it, that there is something. Again, these fluctuations year by year is not important. The tendency <laughs> overall is there. And yes, the sea level is rising and uh, gets some problem. And there's a nice quote from John Kerry, the former Secretary of State of the United States of America, and he said, now I know there are still a few who insist that climate change is just one big hoax, even a political conspiracy. My friends, these people are so out of touch with science that they believe rising sea levels don't matter because in their view, the extra water is just going to spill out over the sides of a flat earth. I think this is a very nice quote and it shows that we really have an issue. The Arctic ice, you can see it from space, you can see it, and again, you need data sets over many years, and you see how the ice is moving. Yeah? So you see, of course, in summer and winter it's different, but if you see it step by step, it is really getting smaller and smaller, and even a few uh, hundred of kilomet kilometers is already a big issue. So you see here the timing, and you see that it's, sometimes it's growing again, but overall, in average, it is decreasing, and this is, of course, causing uh, big problems for our Earth. Now, raising awareness for me is always something which is not only number crunching, not only these pictures, but sometimes it's also a question of uh, emotions. And I would use always emotions to raise awareness. If an astronaut looks down to the Earth and says how beautiful he sees the Earth, I mean, this is touching, this is more touching than just a satellite picture, because the astronaut has a soul and can say, no, it's so beautiful. There is another picture later on which shows it again. Some people believe, okay, let's go to Mars and stay over there. Um, and uh, I know one should never say a bad word about a dead person, but uh, Stephen Hawking, he said, um, humanity may have uh, less than 600 years to leave Earth. And I think this is a very bad sentence. He, is a, he was a very bright scientist, but to say we can leave the Earth to go to another planet means we don't have to take care of our planet. We, can, we have a good excuse, we destroy it, and then we find the next planet. And people believe, yes, we can go to Mars, and they believe this is the future of humankind on Mars. And I just can say this is for me total nonsense. Colonization of Moon or Mars is bullshit. And it, it's, it, there is no real positive image in it to stay then in, in, uh, in cans and uh, being not able to be out of the cans uh, in, in the free world. So this is for me not a solution at all. Therefore, also we as ESA, we don't look for colonization of Moon or Mars. We believe to go there for research is fine, but not for permanent stay. If one should think about permanent stay, then one has to go a little bit deeper into a universe. The next place which seems to be interesting is just 39 light years away. That means if we send a signal, we are coming, <coughs> then in 78 years they can send back, please don't come. <laughs> <laughs> so therefore, uh, but uh, this is anyhow, it's an interesting place, uh, this Trappist one, because it has a, a system of uh, seven planets, 
uh, orbiting around the, their sun. And some of them are in an area where we could believe that there is something like uh, life. So, but we don't know. Uh, and again, 39 light years to go there is just impossible for humankind uh, of today. I will, anyhow, I will, because I'm always fascinated from this Trappist one, I will give you another thing just to think about it. Because discovery means also to understand sometimes the things we don't understand. And when scientists started to look to this system, they did not understand. They said, this will not work. This solar system will not work because the planets are too close to each other. But obviously it works. So what the hell is wrong with this system? Is the system wrong or is our calculation wrong? And then discovery means sometimes to go beyond their own, their own topic, beyond their own disciplines, to go interdisciplinary. And in this case, it was a musician who found the solution. Because what he did, he observed the, the frequency of the orbiting satellite, of the orbiting planets, and multiplied them, them by 212 million. Don't ask me why 212, not 213, or 211, but anyhow, why 212? And by that, he got suddenly a sound out of it. So, this is just multiplying with the frequency with 212 million. Now the next planet, and you hear already there is something special with the, with the different tones. Now the next one. So, and I can go on and on. So it's a harmonic sequence. That means these, these, uh, set, these planets are in a harmonic sequence and that is a solution which the scientists as such did not find out. So it was a musician finding it. And that's my plea is for discovery we need always people from different disciplines. That's the idea from that point. And again, to go there is a little bit, uh, you have to go really in a different way. So if you know the movie Interstellar, that's the way to go, but we don't have the technology today. And therefore, the place to be is this one. This is the place to be. And we should take care of this planet whenever we can. And a nice picture to make this even stronger, this message, again, raising awareness, is from Samantha Cristoforetti a European astronaut with an Italian driver license. And uh, she took this picture of the Earth. And I mean, this really shows what our world is. You see here the very thin atmosphere. If, if you reduce the size of the Earth to the size of a football, the thickness of air in which you can still breathe is less than the thickness of a single hair. So reducing the size of the Earth to a football, the size, the, the thickness of the atmosphere is thinner than a single hair. That thickness of air. That means for me, we better take care of it. Therefore, I like this picture which she uh, brought back very much. The other thing is her face. This is after landing. I don't know whether you have ever been in the steppe of Kazakh. It's not the most beautiful place in the world. But obviously, her face is saying, I'm so happy to be back. And whatever she has over here, I don't know what it is. She's saying, this is smelling, I'm, I'm really, I, I have a, a smell of the earth. So this is a positive message, take care of this earth. This is the message from this picture. Now, we are facing climate change. So discovery, monitoring, now um, raising awareness, now we should come to mitigation. And many people say mitigation with climate change, this is not possible. Climate change is just too big, we cannot change it. It was in 1930, when they were in the United States of America, the so-called Dust Bowl Great Plains. That was, that was because of intensive agriculture, they had really changed the environment. And they had dust winds, dusty storms like this, like hell. So it was really bad. And then there was, uh, from Roosevelt, he had created the so-called New Deal. And he, in this New Deal, also defined, let's counteract this big change. And what they did is, and I could not find the final numbers, millions or billions, it wasn't clear from literature, of trees. And they succeeded. The thing is done. It's, it's positive now. So therefore, we should not say climate change is a too big uh, 
catastrophe, we cannot tackle it. We can, and we have possibilities, and we should, immediately. And we can do it in different ways. I'm now looking just to the, the question, what can space bring to that? I'm not looking to all the different other possibilities, uh, politics, etc., etc. I'm just looking to technologies coming from space. One is satellite navigation. With satellite navigation, everybody is using it, hopefully everybody is using Galileo, and not this American copy, which is called GPS. <laughs> Galileo is three times better, and if you have a modern smartphone or whatever, then you have already Galileo built in, so it's uh, working, so you don't have to switch it on or off. It is working, so therefore. So what can we do with uh, satellite navigation? I will give you some examples. Number one, we don't look only for the fastest route or the shortest route. We look also for the route which is the greenest route. So it's very simple. It's, it's very simple. We can do it. So this, this uh, unfortunately, in our normal navigation system, this, this uh, option is not offered. But it would be. It, it is possible, so we should do it. So there is no, no reason not to do it. Another example is contrails. Do you know that about 5% of the clouds are produced by planes? 5%. It's an enormous number. The effect of contrails on climate change is not known. It's unfortunately, I asked the scientists several times, it's not known. But at least there is an imp impact on the clouds, so we better try to reduce it. And we can reduce it, for instance, through navigation to finding the right route and the right height, where to fly, the flight level. By that you can reduce contrails dramatically. And also, like with the cars, in the, in, the, in the case of cars, I said eco route. Here I would say the shortest route is the best also to reduce congestion in, in, uh, in air because all of this is polluting. So therefore, we can with navigation, we can already do a lot. Another thing, another example. This is a mission. We are going to the, um, to the uh, planet uh, Mercury. It's a seven-year ride. We have electric mobility, everybody is talking about electric mobility uh, right now and when you look to the cars, they think, they think about 300 or 400 kilometers of, of possible ways. We go now 9 billion kilometers. It's not fair because of course we are in the vacuum, but it's electric mobility with an electric engine, but this is not the point. The point is, for this electric engine, we need electricity. You will get the electricity from these solar panels. These solar panels have the same size of an Airbus, so it's really huge. And the solar panels were developed from space, for space, because in space we needed them already 60 years ago. There was no solar panel, but we needed it. Now, we are going on, and the, the um, uh, efficiency of these panels to go to Mercury had to be increased dramatically. So Mercury is the closest uh, planet to the sun, so why, why the hell do we need then more efficient solar panels? That's, looks, that sounds a little bit stupid, but the very simple thing is, if you fly like this towards Mercury, the sun will burn you. So you have to incline it. But by inclination you get less sun on your panels. And therefore, we had to increase the efficiency of the solar panels, and we are now at 30%, which is a world record for these uh, panels. Um, and that means also we can use them on Earth, and we had also some couple of days uh, ago another launch uh, where we are looking to the sun, and again, similar solar panels were used uh, also because of the temperature, they have to be inclined, but again, uh, in order to have uh, enough electricity, they uh, need a higher uh, efficiency. Okay, if we have the sun, but where to use it? I know that uh, Ireland is a very nice place, sunny place, unfortunately it's not <laughs> right now here. But you see already in this picture, which is uh, done by satellites, to look to what are the best places to use uh, solar energy. And also it's a very nice country, it's not the most uh, the most uh, sunny country of the world. You see over here that we have areas in Africa and areas in, in the US which have a much better 
um, energy input coming from the sun. Um, that we are still have some holes over here. This is because of clouds which are there during the year. So this is looking to the energy uh, uh, for a full year. So in, now there you should have your solar panels. There you should have whatever you use to uh, develop uh, to move energy from the sun to electricity. Now you, the, the problem is you still here in Ireland. You need to have the electricity. So you cannot say, okay, we are all going to. Africa because there we have the electricity and now the question is where do we need the electricity and this picture shows and there's island uh, included this picture shows where you need the energy a very simple method looking during night to the earth and seeing if it's bright over there then you know there is electricity so there you see that uh, Europe and also um, uh, here in the northern part of uh, uh, America but on the on the east coast, while here this is on the west coast, coast, you need a lot of energy. And therefore, one of the ideas was, which was developed using these pictures, is to have the, the solar uh, coming in Africa and then transport them to Europe. One further action is, action is and this is something we tried to do in ESA as well, we said we will develop a digital ESA. This is now wherever you look, everybody is talking about digitalization. But we believe that we can at the same time go for a green ESA. And green ESA means that we are really taking care of uh, this climate change by reducing and abandoning any plastics. We decided that now to do this within two years. I said we can do it faster, but two years is still challenging. And by some other aspects uh, of reducing paper, reducing all of this, uh, using more the modern media we have. And therefore, this is also something where you cannot just say the responsibility is with the organizations, but each and everyone can take care also with technology. And um, this technology is available, for instance, also telecommunication. With telecommunication, you can have meetings around the world without traveling from one place to the other. So telecommunication from space is also a big supporter for that. And if there is the, the, the remark, but telecommunication is not uh, secured enough, then we have solutions to have also secure telecommunication around the world. So what I wanted to say is, if you look back to what I said at the beginning, these four different steps, discovery, monitoring, raising awareness and mitigation, one should always consider all at the same time and not uh, just stay with one and complain about the others. So with that, I conclude my presentation, but my final word goes back to the aspect I tried to explain that was the question of society, competition and environment. Environment, I hope I could show you, but in order to move forward uh, with uh, uh, acting against climate change, we need motivated people. And this is something which is very difficult. You can try to motivate people by complaining. This is the way which is right now done worldwide. I'm not uh, convinced that that's the right way. Motivation goes through inspiration. And inspiration goes through fascination. And there, space can also deliver something because there is nobody who is not fascinated by what is done in space. So if something is done in space, people are fascinated. This is already a positive move in our brains. If these people then think about it, they might be inspired, thinking about, okay, to understand that somebody had an idea, an unbelievable idea to go with a spacecraft to Mercury or to Mars or wherever, and he or she realized it. So if this is the second step, the third step is, okay, if somebody did that with his dreams, then I can do it also with my dream. And if these dreams are for dreams for a better world, then climate change is not any longer a complaint or a fear, but is an opportunity for people. And I think we have to move from seeing climate change only as something bad to see it as something for opportunity to make our world better for the future. Thank you very much for your attention.